these attempts by both the right and the left to say either, you know, all refugees are terrorists or all refugees are like helpless victims are, I think, sort of equally bullshit. You know, I think it's worth keeping in mind that this is a country that was settled by immigrants on stolen land that we killed huge numbers of people to take over. We did not earn this land. You know, a lot of us were lucky enough to be born here. We have an awful lot of space. We have an economy that can accept a lot of people and, in fact, needs a lot of people. Like, every study that has come out has shown that the limitations that this administration has put on immigration are hurting literally every sector of the economy, from agriculture to manufacturing to tech. Every type of collar that you want to you want to put on a job is being damaged by not allowing not just refugees, but all immigrants to continue coming into the country. Welcome to Let's Give a Damn, the podcast that inspires and equips you to give more dams than ever before. We bring you the amazing stories of people from all walks of life who saw something wrong and gave a damn about it. I'm your host, Nick LaPara, and I'm incredibly thrilled to bring you today's conversation and guest. A few weeks ago, I did a podcast with Zach Iskol. Remember him? Amazing human and the founder of Headstrong, Higher Purpose and Task and Purpose. During our chat, he mentioned the name Becca Heller. He shared a bit of the work she does, and I immediately thought, I need to meet this woman. She must be on the podcast. Zach told me he would put me in touch with her and that she was going to be on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah that very evening to talk about Trump's refugee ban. Tomorrow is World Refugee Day, and my guest tonight is the director and co-founder of the International Refugee Assistance Project, a group that has helped more than 200,000 refugees and displaced persons find legal pathways to safety. Please welcome Becca Heller. I watched it, and I immediately connected with her spirit, her vision, and her passion. I emailed her, she agreed to be on, and today you get to hear the fruit of our conversation. Becca Heller is the co-founder of IRAP, the International Refugee Assistance Project. They organize law students and lawyers to essentially help displaced persons. IRAP serves the world's most persecuted individuals and empowers the next generation of human rights leaders. Remember just a few days after Trump became president and he issued the first version of his Muslim travel ban? While many of us were irate and didn't know what to do to help, Becca and a few other organizations rallied literally thousands of lawyers in just a few hours to go to airports to assist refugees as they arrived in the U.S. only to be turned away. I was glued to Twitter during those days as these lawyers tirelessly served refugees in such incredible ways, and I had no idea Becca was one of the masterminds behind this incredible effort. I imagine some of you would like for me to shut the hell up so you can hear more from her. So let's get right into it. Here's my conversation with the incredible Becca Heller. Welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast, Becca Heller. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. I am thrilled that you're here. I am a Becca Heller fanboy. I didn't know I had fanboys, I guess. Oh, you do. Well, you do. You do now. And here's why. At least one. Because, <laughs> yeah, you have one. But here's here's why. So I'm going to give a quick, for those listening, a quick backstory as to why you're even on here. A few weeks ago, I interviewed our mutual friend, uh, Zach Iskol, on the podcast. He's he's talking about you. He's talking you up in the conversation. He just went on and on about Becca Heller this. And I was like, I don't know if I know her. What does she do? So he told me. And then he emailed me later that day and was like, she's going to be on um, The Tonight Show with, with uh, Trevor Noah. You need to watch that. And so I was like, oh, cool. Well, she's on The Tonight Show. That's really cool. So I watched it. Um, unfortunately I watched it after the fact because I don't have like live who has live TV anyway these days. And so I, I watched it afterward and I just knew from the moment you started talking and interacting with, with Trevor on his show, I just knew that I wanted to speak to you more because I loved your, I loved your attitude, your spirit, your wit, and obviously your passion for refugees and helping them in the way that you do. So thank you for definitely being here. And I'm excited to, uh, dig into your story a little bit more over the next few minutes. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's begin this way. We're going to get into the work that you do and how you got into it and the impact that it's having in a few minutes. But before we do that, share with me, share with us 
a little bit of your backstory because I, I'm I'm looking for clues, uh, the people, the places, the things that formed you and made you into who you are today. Because I I think we will probably pick up on some stuff maybe that happened through your life that kind of led you down the path that you uh, have gone, or or maybe not. But let's explore that for a minute. So just share a little bit about your story with us. My backstory. I have been really obsessed w- with my own death from the age of about three and a half. Okay. And not obsessed in a positive way, like for a long time afraid. And then I actually did exposure therapy about it when I turned 30, which um, largely helped me not have anxiety over it anymore, which was pretty amazing. Um, But I've always just, it's been sort of an obsession of mine that life is is really short um, and that we don't have that long on this planet and that I all that you can really do about it is try to make the most of the time that you have. So a big sort of guiding principle for me and how I try to exist. Um, and I, I happen to like not believe that you get another shot. I don't believe in afterlives or reincarnation. I, you know, for people who do, I'm jealous. I wish that I did. Uh, but, you know, so I, I think it's about sort of making the most of the time that you have here. Um, and, and that manifests in a number of different ways. But I think one of them is just a desire for, like, the time that I've spent on this earth to have been net positive for the other people who are on the earth at the same time as me. Uh, so I've always just been very motivated by, you know, the plight of the fellow humans who are on this long, strange trip with me. Okay. So from three and a half, you started feeling that, but what, what kind of happened along the way that helped you think more clearly about the brevity of life? And I, I too, I do believe in the afterlife. I'm a Christian, but I'm also with you in that this life that we have, the, the one that we currently have, it's short, it's unpredictable. You and I could, you know, you just talked right before getting on the phone about a health scare in your family. And like, we just don't know how long we have. And so I'm a huge proponent of, you know, one day we're going to die. I think about death every day. I'm just like you, I don't, though I didn't start at three and a half. But like what along the way, like helped you develop those thoughts, um, thus leading you toward the kinds of things that you ended up doing? Was it, was it family members or just your personal study or things you saw as you you were in you know elementary school, then middle school, high school, or what was it? I really don't remember. Okay. I remember um, seeing a homeless person. I don't know if it was the first time I saw a homeless person, but it's my first memory of a homeless person. I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, so homelessness is really visible, especially because it doesn't get cold in the winter. And right. at least at the time, um, there wasn't a lot of enforcement against sleeping on the street. And because it didn't get too cold, sleeping on the street was like a feasible thing to do in a way that um, it's not in New York, at least in post-Giuliani New York. Um, and I didn't live in pre-Giuliani New York, so I can't speak to that. But I understand that things were different <laughs> anecdotally. Um, and I remember asking my – I think I was four or five. And I remember um, asking my parents, you know, why can we – you know, we have extra room in our house. Like, can he just come home and stay with us? And they were like, no, he can't. And I, I don't remember what explanation they gave me. I mean, my parents are, you know, my dad was a doctor. My mom was a teacher. They're both sort of in like the caring professions. They're both um, very sort of public service oriented people. I don't think they would consider themselves activists, um, but definitely in you know, they they like to help and they want to help people. And so I, I suspect that they gave me an answer that was like fairly like Bay Area liberal lefty. But I remember just being completely confounded by it and, and just like, but we have extra space and he has nowhere to sleep. Why can't we take him home? Um, and that that stuck with me for a really long time. And I think all through middle school and high school, I continued to be really bothered by the way that I saw injustice manifest around me, but I, I didn't feel like I knew how to do anything about it. I think part of it was, was being young and part of it was just not feeling empowered and, or not knowing where to start. I mean, I think a lot of people at any age often feel that way, like especially these days that they look around and they're like, oh my goodness, like the problems of the world are so large. Like what what could I possibly have to contribute? And then I, uh, I fucked up applying to college. Okay, yeah. I applied to two places early decision. Um, and long story short, they found out and uh, they both revoked their offers of admission. So then I was just going to go to 
UC Berkeley and transfer. Nothing against UC Berkeley, but you can walk there from my parents' house. And I I did not want my parents to be able to walk to my college dorm room. <laughs> that was a, a yeah, big thing. You wanted me. to get away. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, at least driving distance. And I was talking to one of my best friends from high school one night on the phone, and he he I'm sure he put it more nicely than this, but the way that I remember it in my head is him saying, you know, you're always talking about how you want to help people and you really want to make a difference. Like now is your chance. Why don't you put your money where your mouth is? Like take a year off and try to make yourself useful. <laughs> um, and he never ever would have actually phrased it that way. So that's just the way that I internalized it. And so I did. Um, I, I turned down Berkeley, decided I would reapply and spent a year um, first in London with a service learning project, actually working with refugees by total coincidence. Um, and then when I ran out of money, I came back and lived with my parents and I did AmeriCorps, which I just found like incredibly empowering in terms of like the tools that they gave me and the projects that they allowed me to take on and the coaching I got. And so I, I feel like by the time I started college, I had a much better sense of you know, okay, there's injustice in the world, but like, actually you can do things about it. And even me at 18 or 19 with no applicable skills whatsoever, you know, there's, there's still ways that I can contribute. And I think just that sort of confidence and sense of empowerment over some of the like negative circumstances of humans on the planet was really crucial for me in terms of my like career and sort of activisty work going forward. I love that because there's multiple ways here that you're that where you saw something wrong and you decided to do something about it. That's where I see a lot of people fall short is they see something wrong and one obstacle in to trying to figure out if they can do something about it, they quit because it's too hard, it's inconvenient, whatever. And it seems like you in different ways growing up were able to overcome that, right? Even, you know, you could have told your buddy, even if he said it nicely, you could have said, that's a stupid idea. Like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to take a year off. But you didn't. You said, no, this, this, he's right. This is an opportunity. So that's a real cool theme that I see, you know, coming through your life so far. So you're the director and co-founder of IRAP, the International Refugee Assistance Project, which I'm very impressed by, very excited to learn more about. How did that come about? And what is the work that you all do? Sure. Um, so I was between my first and second years at law school, and uh, this will tie in many of the themes that we've just discussed, actually. Um, and I was doing an internship in Israel, and there just wasn't really enough for me to do, in part because in Israel, it turns out they practice the law in Hebrew, which I didn't manage to figure out before I got there, which is on me. Um, and in part because the organization was having a lot of weird internal drama, which is on them. Um, but the upshot was that I was just like sitting around in this air conditioned office in Tel Aviv watching Mad Men, which is a great show. But I eventually ran out of episodes. Fantastic show. Yeah. There had only been two seasons at the time because this was 2008 or, you know, some small number of seasons. And then I was just like sitting around with nothing to do. And I really hate wasting my time <laughs> for reasons that we discussed. So um, I hadn't really been to the Middle East before. I had been to Israel once for two weeks for my brother's bar mitzvah um, on like an incredibly sheltered trip with a bunch of other like Northern California sort of upper middle class Jewish families on an air conditioned bus. Um, I'd never been to the Arab Middle East and I, I really hadn't seen Israel much. And so I kept hearing about all of these Iraqi refugees in Jordan and decided I was just going to quit my internship and go to Jordan and try to talk to some of the Iraqis who were living there, thinking that um, as an American, I had a responsibility to learn about the humanitarian fallout of my country's foreign policy. And so I emailed everyone that I could think of and eventually through a very attenuated series of people ended up being able to go to Amman for a week. And I met with six families, all of them just like in their own living rooms. And I, I had lived in sub-Saharan Africa for a couple years between college and law school working on HIV and malnutrition stuff. So I was sort of expecting, you know, your like typical like foreign aid savior complex panoply of things of just like lack of access to food and basic housing and education. And, and those things were all present. 
But what I found really surprising that I hadn't been expecting was that every single one of the families independently identified their primary problem as essentially a legal problem, which is that they couldn't go back to Iraq because something really horrible had happened to them that had forced them to flee. That's that's the definition of a refugee, that you, you can't go back to your home country because of something really awful. It's a simplified version of the definition. Um, but they couldn't stay in Jordan because... Jordan, like most of the countries in the Middle East, is not a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of Refugees. So they they just didn't have access to any services. They couldn't work. There was no kind of path to legalization. They were never going to be able to begin their lives over. So all of them were trying to get resettled to a country like the US or Canada or someplace in Europe or Australia. But none of them understood how the resettlement process worked. Um, Because it's in retrospect, because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, Although at the time, I assumed that just nobody understood it. And everyone I met thought that they were on some kind of wait list. And everyone had a story of like their, you know, neighbors, cousins, former dog owners, like mother-in-law who had been on the wait list, but had waited long enough and eventually had gotten a call and had gotten to get on a plane to Toronto. So... I thought that, you know, at the very least, one thing that I could do to try to help empower people was to give them a sense of how long the wait list was. Because I think, you know, I think refugees get really misportrayed in the media in a number of ways. One of the ways they're misportrayed is this idea of the refugee as like a helpless victim. Um, when by definition, a refugee is someone who went through something really terrible and then like got out under like incredibly difficult circumstances. And so I thought if I could just say, okay, if you can wait for six months or 12 months or two years, whatever it is, then people could make a plan um, and kind of live their lives accordingly. So I finagled a meeting at the end of the week with um, the U.S. Embassy and the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees. And I was just like, oh, I'm a Yale Law student. Can you tell me a little bit about this refugee gig that you guys have going on here? Um, And they were trying to explain it to me. And of course, it made no sense because the program makes no sense because it hasn't been updated since about 1951, give or take. Um, And then at the end, I was like, okay, well, you know, how long is the wait list? And they said, what wait list? Oh, my word. Yeah. I, I at first thought that the wait list was like this nefarious rumor that like the U.S. and the U.N. were deliberately propagating to try to like placate refugees because it's like, oh, don't be mad that we're not processing your applications fast enough. Like there's a wait list, we swear. And, um, and then in thinking about it and talking to a bunch of people, I eventually came to to at least theorize, if not realize, because I I still don't know for sure, but I I strongly believe that the waitlist rumor actually emerged from within the refugee community itself. Because if you are living at the bottom of a deep, dark hole in order to get out of bed in the morning, you have to believe that there's some kind of light at the top. And so I think they invented the waitlist as, as sort of something to hope for in a really hopeless place. And the fact that the best symbol of hope that they could come up with was also the symbol of an inefficient bureaucracy that isn't working struck me as so tragic <laughs> that I wanted to try to go back to school and and try to do something about it. And that's really how how I got turned on to the issue um, and how the, my idea at any rate to, to do something about this started. Thank you for, you know, kind of retelling some of that. I mean, it's both tragic and hopeful that you, you know, did something about it. But again, you could have, at this point, you could have said, well, I'll figure out how I can get involved. But you could have just kind of taken a very passive, I'll help when I can. But you went on to co-found IRAP. How did that happen? How did that come to fruition? And, and what exactly is happening today? Because I know, because I've, I've been scouring your website and I love the work that's being done. I want to figure out how to get involved. I'm not a a lawyer in, or anything in that capacity. But from the moment that you came back and said, I want to do something, how did this all come to fruition? So a group of students at Yale Law sort of came together and decided to found a student organization to assist the refugees. And then our supervising professor, Mike Wishney, called us into his office one day and said, you guys aren't providing legal assistance to refugees, are you? And we sort of punted and we're like, oh, that's an interesting question. Why do you ask? And he said, because that's illegal. You're not lawyers. You can't provide legal aid to people. And we were like, oh, shit, we better find some lawyers. 
So we realized that law firms would come to campus and recruit all the time. So we just started calling around to law firms and saying, hey, do you want to you know, get to know some of us better? Why don't you supervise us on these cases? And so this model emerged whereby we would get cases referred by NGOs or individuals on the ground. And then we would assign the cases to teams of law students matched with lawyers at private law firms, and the firms would cover the cost of the case. And I'm really obsessed with efficiency, again, because, you know, life is short. And so I spent the first year really trying to figure out, like, who was already doing this, because it, it seemed really obvious to me um, that, like, if you're in a legal process and your life depends on the outcome that someone has suggested at some point that you should have good legal counsel. In the asylum process in the U.S., which is um, substantively identical to the refugee process, the only difference being that you're in the U.S. trying to stay as opposed to outside of the U.S. trying to get in, um, a bunch of studies, including by the federal government itself, have found that having a lawyer alone with all other variables accounted for makes you four times as likely to get a grant of asylum than anything else. Um, so like your, your life is, is pretty literally on the line. And I spent a year trying to figure out who was doing this and eventually just realized that nobody was. Um, so the next summer I decided to just pull the trigger and apply for fellowships that will allow me to start doing this full time when I graduated and I graduated and took the bar in 2010 and started in September of 2010. And today we have a staff of about 50 um, with offices in New York and in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, we provide direct legal aid to several thousand refugees every year. We provide um, legal counseling to tens of thousands more through an online hotline that we have. We do congressional advocacy and litigation um, that in total has impacted the lives of over 200,000 refugees. And thanks to the policies coming down from this administration, we continue to really have our work cut out for us. Golly. Well, first of all, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude for the work that you're doing. I'm going to, in the show notes, when we when this thing airs, I'm going to put a bunch of links in there that I want people to look at just to, so they can see a little bit more about the work that you're doing. I'm super excited. And yes, to, to your last point, you do have more work than you probably ever imagined you'd have right now because of certain things that are happening. Talk to me about this for a minute. Recently, when the when the Muslim ban went into effect for the first time, and you know it was this really kind of like turnkey thing. It was in effect really quickly, and people were already on their way over, and it was chaotic for a few days. I was following it super super closely. I imagine you guys had. I mean, that was a very tense time for you all. What happened on your team in your organization during that time when the Muslim ban went into effect? So the text of the ban actually leaked like the first business day that Trump was in office, which was a Monday. Um, so first we – and everyone knew that something like that was coming, but nobody knew when. Like Tr Trump had promised to do a huge number of devastating things in his campaign, and sure. no one knew kind of what was going to come first. And then it became really obvious that the thing that was going to come first was the Muslim ban. So we had been talking about how we would respond, but we didn't realize we were going to need to respond so quickly. Um, so our first move was to call all of our clients who had permission to travel and say, get on a plane. Um, because, you know, when you're – a refugee and you're traveling, you're, you're packing up your whole life forever. <laughs> right. Um, right. And that can take a minute, um, especially because, you you know, you're moving to a place where like you don't have any money. You don't know if you'll have a job. You want to sell your house. Like at, in the U.S. often you'll say like, oh, my family has lived in this town for 80 or 100 years and that's a really long time. And in the Middle East, people will be like, my family has owned this house for 3,000 years. You know, so what you do with that house when you leave is, is a pretty big deal. Um, and so we called people and just said, you know, like, get your affairs in order and get on a plane because the doors to the U.S. are closing and we don't know to whom and we don't know when and we don't know when they're going to open. Um, so we were just organizing people to get on flights and law firms were covering the cost of the plane tickets. And then about halfway through the week, um, we had a transgender client who was flying into LAX. 
And with, with transgender clients, travel is always really tricky because if they're coming from a country that doesn't recognize transgender as a thing um, or like punishes it by death, as many countries in in the world do, um, you can't like go to the DMV or the social security office and say, Hey, when I was born, they said I was a woman and named me Becca, but actually like I'm a man and my name is Zach. And can you please give me a passport that reflects that? So you worry about people traveling on identity documents that don't match their identity. And typically you worry about that on like exiting a country. Um, but this time we were really worried about entry that like what happens when this woman lands at LAX with documents claiming that she's a man and that use a different name than the name that she uses um, and that show sort of a different picture than what she really looks like. Is, is the U.S. going to use that as an excuse like to fuck with her in some way? And, and we really didn't know, but we also didn't think it was a good idea for her to put off her travel because we knew the ban was coming down at any minute. So we decided to just have a lawyer quietly waiting in the arrivals area of LAX who she had his WhatsApp contact um, so she could reach out to him if something happened. And thankfully, nothing did. The ban didn't come down that day. She arrived without incident. She's doing really well now, which is fantastic. But I was G-chatting with my policy director that night, and we, we like I've gone back and looked at the G-chat transcript, and we sound drunk, um, which we were not. We were just <laughs> exhausted. But it's not it's just not tired. really worth like preserving or regurgitating for posterity, uh, posterity rather. Suffice to say that we realized that that this person was not the only person who would potentially be in midair at the time that the ban came down. Um, that at whatever point the ban came down, there were going to be thousands of people who were like in planes or on boats or however, you know, people are sort of crossing uh, international territory these days who, when they departed, had legal permission to enter the U.S. And when they arrived at a port of entry, would no longer have legal permission and nobody knew it was going to happen to them. And so we started organizing lawyers to to go to airports around the country. And at first our goal was just to try to get like three or four lawyers at each of the major international airports. Um, we sent out an email, I think Thursday morning calling for volunteers. We set up a Google form within like 45 minutes of us sending out the email, 1600 people had signed up and the Google form had crashed. Wow. And the protests were like almost totally spontaneous. It was pretty amazing how people just mobilized and, you know, not dissimilarly, I think, to what happened at the border with the child separation policy that just like a bunch of Americans were like, this is not okay. We're, we don't know what we're going to do, but we're just going to show up and make it clear that we do not think that this is okay. Um, and so the ban came down at 4.30 p.m. on Friday the 27th, and we had clients who were in the air at the time, and one of them, Hamid Darwish, was scheduled to land at JFK that evening, and at about 8 or 8.30, I had just put my daughter to bed, and I got a call that um, the law students and the lawyer who had worked on his case who were waiting for him at the airport um, had had let us know that his wife and child had emerged and that he hadn't come out uh, because he was locked in a room with a number of other individuals. He had been handcuffed um, and they didn't know when he was coming. And Hamid uh, worked as an interpreter for the U.S. military in Iraq for 10 years on a Ford operating base, which, amongst other things, uh, means that he's been through a minimum of 20 military grade level security clearances. And yet under the travel ban, he was a national security threat. So I called my law school professor, a friend of mine at the National Migration Law Center. We looped in the ACLU and basically um, came up with the idea to file a class action lawsuit. We didn't know who was being held at airports because they were essentially like turning the airports into black sites. So you didn't even know who was being held there. So we just filed a class action lawsuit that said anyone who's being held pursuant to the travel ban is being held illegally and has to be released. And we stayed up all night writing it and we filed it at five in the morning because we wanted it on file before any international flights could take off because we didn't want them to be able to deport anybody. Um, and we had a hearing that night and legal alert from the ACLU argued it and we got a ruling in our favor at 8 p.m. So it took 28 hours from the issuing of the ban to the ruling we got saying that everyone had to be released. 
And we later found out that approximately 2,100 people were released from airport detention all over the country as a result of that ruling. Holy shit. Yeah. I just got like goosebumps just listening to that timeline and how how short it was, how quickly you all moved. I mean, I, at the time, I think this will be awesome for people to actually hear uh, you talk about that because at the time – we're watching whatever we're watching, not a TV, but Twitter and everything and watching this thing all, all happen. And then the lawsuit that you just talked about that you, you all, you know, I don't know what the term, the wording is, but you all issued or filed. Like I knew that was happening, but I had no idea that it was you and you know, the lawyers that you, you all had banded together. That's truly amazing. Yeah. It was, it was a big team effort. <laughs> I mean, it was us and these other organizations, but also it was like America. Like I, I didn't get to the airport until something like noon on Saturday because I had been up trying to deal with the lawsuit. And then we we had we were being inundated with like press calls at that point. Um, so I didn't know that there were protests. And I got to JFK and there were like thousands of people outside. And I remember calling my deputy legal director and being like, who the fuck are all these people? <laughs> and she was just like, they're Americans. Like they showed up because they're pissed yeah. off about the travel ban. And I was just, I was like, oh my God, that, that's amazing. That is amazing. Becca, if I could hand you a microphone that could reach the ears of all Americans, the reality is, you know, refugees more than most, if not all, you know, Americans with, with the exception of a few, you know, refugees super, super well. They're, they're everything about them. So if I could give you a megaphone that could reach all ears, what would you want to communicate to Americans, especially those that haven't traveled much and especially, especially those who have not gone out of their way to get to know a refugee? Because most places, not everywhere, obviously, there's a lot of people out in the middle of nowhere that you know, there's not a, not a lot of refugees there, but most people can become friends with a refugee. I mean, they're everywhere. They're in all of our cities. They're in all of our towns. So what would you, what would be your message to all Americans uh, regarding refugees? I mean, number one, like there, there's no singular message about refugees, right? There's 65 million displaced people in the world. Like you can't, you can't essentialize them. Like everyone's had a different sure. experience. So these attempts by both the right and the left to say either, you know, all refugees are terrorists or all refugees are like helpless victims um, are, I think, sort of equally bullshit. You know, I think it's worth keeping in mind that that this is a country that was settled by immigrants on stolen land that we killed huge numbers of people to take over. We did not earn this land. You know, a lot of us were lucky enough to be born here. We have an awful lot of space. We have an economy that can accept a lot of people and, in fact, needs a lot of people. Like, every study that has come out has shown that the limitations that this administration has put on immigration are hurting literally every sector of the economy, from agriculture to manufacturing to tech. Every type of collar that you want to you want to put on a job is being damaged by not allowing not just refugees, but all immigrants to continue coming into the country. And I think, you know, refugees, like all immigrants, are the things that they have in common are that they have a big dream, right? Like things aren't great for them at home. Um, refugees are being persecuted. Things are really, really bad for them at home. But no one wants to leave home. There's a poem by a British Somali poet called Worse on Shira, and it has this one line that says, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. Mm. No one puts their child in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Nobody wants to leave what they know and where their family has been for, for generations and go somewhere else. It has to really take something serious to, to push you to go. So everyone is fleeing something. Everyone is dreaming of something bigger. And everyone is willing to put in the incredibly, incredibly hard work to do that, whether it's the work of navigating the resettlement process of, you know, getting through the Northern Triangle and up across all of Mexico and across the border, the work of starting your whole life over with, you know, professional degrees don't translate. So tons and tons of our clients are things like doctors and engineers whose degrees just aren't any good here. So they're stocking grocery stores now, but they're hoping that their kids can do better. Um, 
I just think that like the the one thing that all immigrants have in common is that they're escaping something really difficult, wanting something much better, and just willing to work their asses off for it. And ever since I saw Hamilton, I've been like obsessively reading U.S. history. Mm, yeah. And as far as I can tell, like those are the exact ideals that we fought the American Revolution for. Yep. <laughs> of just yep. like – you know, we all came here to get certain freedoms, and we believe that we deserve those freedoms because we're willing to fight for them and we're willing to work with them and we, for them, and we really believe in them. And I think that if we are still, you know, wanting to take our constitution seriously and the underlying tenets of what we, you know, if, if you really want to make America great again, you have to think about like what are the things that makes America great. And to me, the things that make America great are that we're hardworking and entrepreneurial and we dream big and we don't discriminate. And I think that, you know, immigrants and refugees, you know, whether you're illegal or legal, documented or undocumented, like embody all of those things. Like they're as, they're as American as you get when it really comes down to it. Yeah, completely agreed. So then, what's the way forward? You mentioned at the beginning of the last your last answer that, you know, there's really unhelpful dialogue and sentiments on the right and the left about this refugee thing, but even outside the refugee thing. I mean, it's just very tense right now. Like extremely tense. We're waiting for, you know, and not waiting, but we're just we're, you know, when's the next in all caps, Twitter tirade going to happen? Or when's the next like shitty thing going to happen? When's the next video of some, you know, black person getting shot or this, this Muslim person getting berated on a bus? Like, it seems like these things are happening. The answer is this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yes. And so what's the way forward? I envision a future where we can, not in every way, because people are people, but we can become more unified. I want to make actual progress, not just see like these little these little things happen but i want us to move toward actual progress so based on what you know and your wisdom you know from being involved in these conversations and again not just the refugee conversation but just in general in this uh, kind of the america we're in right now what's the way forward what 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 are some steps we can put into place as damn givers those listening that want to give a damn that want to have an impact on the world a positive impact what's the way forward i mean i'm not going to be the first person on your podcast to say this but f- vote Please, please vote. Yes. Uh, register to vote. Get people registered to vote. Don't believe the like fake Russian profiles posting stuff on Facebook. I think a, yes. another sort of useful thing to do that's a pretty easy lift is just to set a Google alert. I think that the you know one of the the things that you're sort of getting at when you say you know the next all caps tweet or the next like video of a African American person being shot is that. We're so inundated with craziness all the time that I think it's really hard to maintain focus on any given issue. Um, so I think it's really easy to forget that, that like refugees are still an issue. And I, I've had people say that to me, like, oh, is that still a thing? And it's like, yes, it's like, especially if you're a refugee, it's still a thing. And even like with the family separation policy at the border, like most families haven't been reunited, but the the news media is really running out of steam on covering it. And meanwhile, all this other crazy stuff is happening. So what whatever issue or issues it is that that you really care about, set a news alert so that at the end of each day you get a digest of what happened on that issue that day, even just as a reminder that like that issue and the problem is still alive and kicking. I think, you know, donate money. Every NGO needs money (laughs) to do the work that they're doing. You can donate time if you have that. You could donate time locally. You could do it directly. If you don't like to leave your house, you could do it by writing an op-ed. If you care particularly about refugee issues, we have action alerts that we send out through our website about, you know, call your congressperson and tell them X. Um, A pretty large number of NGOs and um, like C4 political groups at this point have action alerts that you can sign up for so that even if you can't keep your eye on every single issue at every single time, you can get a heads up on like when the really critical thing is and what you should do at that point. Um, And I think the, the biggest thing is just like don't burn out. Like, yeah, it's a really Mm. hard time to exist. And just like every time I read the news, I feel like moderately traumatized um, and like I need to smoke something. And 
we all just have to like get through that and we can't allow that to turn into just like not paying any attention. I really appreciate those things you just shared because sometimes when I ask uh, my guests a, a form of that question, it's great helpful advice, but it's it's very, very nebulous, very like, you know, just not, nothing really actionable. And you just gave some very actionable steps, vote, get Google alerts, donate. These are very actionable things. Uh, and, and I, I want to highlight the number one once again for everyone listening. If you say that you give a shit about these things and you are not voting, then you don't because that's a way that that's a freedom that we have. That's a privilege we have. And we need to be voting people in and out that we don't want to see there. Um, so very, very important. Um, as we begin to land the plane of this interview, uh, it's time for a not, not so serious question. And this is just just a, just a silly question. But how was it? meeting Trevor Noah. And I asked that because I think the world of that guy, I think he is super fucking hilarious and he's smart and he's witty. And yeah, I hope to, you know, interact with him in some way someday. So was that, was that a fun interaction? It looked like you were having fun. Were you nervous? Were you happy? Oh my God. I was fucking terrified. I was terrified, you know, to prep for the show. Like I watched interviews he did with sort of other people that ran NGOs. And then I also like talked to people and thought, you know, what's it like to be interviewed by him? And the two pieces of advice that I got the most, one of which I obviously ignored one of one was don't try to be funny. Like he's <laughs> the funny one. Um, and the you were second, funny though. You you had a couple good ones there. Yeah, I mean, I just I just try. You know, it was like be yourself, and I was like, but myself is constantly trying to be funny and like maybe not succeeding, but like I don't know, how, you know, like the serious version of me is not me being myself. But the other thing that everyone everyone said is he's super nice. He will go out of his way to make you feel comfortable. And I was like terrified up until the point that I like sat down in that chair and we started talking. And then I all of a sudden I realized like, oh, my gosh, I'm having fun. This is sort of fun. And also like at the risk of objectifying him, like he's so pretty. Yeah, he's no. really, really pretty. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm fairly attracted to him. He's a great that guy. That wasn't the worst thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. That's awesome. OK, penultimate question. A uh, half hypothetical, half not hypothetical. The not hypothetical part is that someday you're going to die. I hope it's many, many years from now, a very fruitful career in helping tens of thousands, millions of refugees and whatever else you put your mind to, but you're going to die someday. And the hypothetical part is that I, for some odd reason, have been asked to give your eulogy. So your family, your friends, Trevor, Noah, all these refugees you've helped, they're all there crammed into this huge room to honor, mourn, and celebrate your life. What do you hope that I would say about your life and legacy on that day? I hope that you put up IREP's website and tell all of them to donate in my memory. <laughs> Amazing. Is that it? It's a, it's a utilitarian moment. There you and go. And I want you to play, uh, what's that Iron and Wine song? I have a funeral song picked out, unsurprisingly, each coming night. I love Iron and Wine. I don't know if I know that song. But um, I'll go listen to it afterwards. Light strikes a deal with each coming night. It is unsurprisingly about death. And it's like the the repeat of the song is, will you say when I'm gone away? So it'll save you from having to do the eulogy. They'll just deliver it. Perfect. There it is. The song plays. We pass out iPads or whatever we're using in 80 years to collect money. And um, we'll raise a ton of money and we'll play that song. And then everyone, I want everyone to get high. Okay. We will have... We will have edibles, we'll have gummies, we'll have uh, food, we'll have iPads to donate, we'll have iron and wine. In fact, I'll get iron and wine live to come perform it if they're still around. You think they're going to outlive me? I feel like they're older than me. They, they are. They are. But who knows? Who knows? Remember, <laughs> brevity of life. We don't know how long this is going to last. It's true. So it's I hope true. you live 80, 80 more years, but it could be two weeks. So. And I guess as we saw from the Super Bowl, even dead musicians can play live performances. That is so true. We Yep. We will get some hologram shit going for you. Um, yeah. what do you want as we, as we wrap up, what I do you want? I have never been asked that question before. <laughs> well, I like to ask everybody and, and I have to admit your episode, you'll be episode like 73 or 74. I've never had anyone take it as lighthearted as you did. And I'm glad you did. You know, usually it's like a somber thing. They take a break and they think about it and you're like, Hey, let's keep IRAP going financially. 
and that's it. And let's get high. So very, again, very actionable. I like, we need to hang out more, Becca. You're like, we're very similar. It's like action steps. Let's go. Let's get this thing moving. I like that. Yeah, no, why fuck around? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So what do you want people, as we wrap up, what do you want people to go look for? Uh, what are some social media handles, website, uh, opportunities? What do you want them to go do? Our website is refugeerights, R-I-G-H-T-S dot O-R-G. Our, our Twitter is at refugee underscore assist. There's lots of places that tweet and promote great things about refugees and immigrants. There was actually a really good Mashable piece um, that was like the top X things to follow if you're interested in immigration, broken down by like activists, immigrants themselves, NGOs, journalists. Um, and as like a somewhat discerning consumer of immigration social media, I thought it was a really good list. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll refer to that as my digest things to follow. Okay, great. I will link to all of those things in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I really had a, a fun time. It was very informative, very passionate. I'm excited to explore more how I can do things in this space. Um, I mean, we're already doing it. We are temporarily, we're living in Nashville right now. We we're hope to be in New York by next year. But, you know, even here in, in Nashville, we've, we've been here eight months. We're already involved in the refugee community, helping them get settled in, helping them get acclimated to life in the U.S. And so we, as a family, and me personally, love to help refugees, help them feel welcome. So there's a very cool organization called Welcoming America that came out of something called Welcoming Tennessee that I would encourage you to check out. Okay, cool. Well, we'll do this again sometime. Thanks so much. Yes, please. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you for giving a damn. Dear friends, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Becca Heller. I hope you were encouraged and challenged also. Per usual, show notes for this episode, including links for Becca and IRAP, can be found at podcast.letsgiveadam.com. That's podcast.letsgiveadam.com. I would love to hear your thoughts on this conversation. So hit me up at hello at nicklapara.com or I'm at nicklapara and at Let's Give a Damn on all of the social media platforms. We have an exciting episode next week with Mayor Ted Terry from Clarkston, Georgia. If you watch Queer Eye, you'll recognize that name from season two, the finale episode. I can't wait to share that conversation with you. As always, this podcast is brought to you by the editing and production skills of Chad Snavely. I love that guy. If you are listening to this and you have made it all the way to the end, I love you. A special I love you for you. Same day, same time next week. Bye for now.